Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Bill 68 till I die. Give it to you. I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Pastor. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. They have no swag. They have no nothing. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Field of 68. After dark. Hello and welcome to the Monday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. My name is Rob Doster. I have Randolph Childress with me. We're live on Sirius XM Channel 84. We're streaming over on Stadium and we are, of course, on YouTube and over on X. Uh, we're here watching the end of this game between number six, Iowa State, and number two, Houston. That has turned into a shootout, Randolph. I did not expect to see both of these teams banging home threes like they got Randolph Childress and Rob Doster out there in their backcourt. Uh, so with that, that's going to be one that we got to track. It's under six minutes left. It's 56 to 50. Uh, Houston is up right now. Before we get into that, we have to head to the ACC. We have to head to your league. And what we have to do is we have to talk about Virginia. The last time that me and you were on a show together and Virginia was brought up, you know what we said, RC? We said, Tony Bennett, I owe you an apology. Tony Bennett, I am sorry. Tony Bennett, we should never have ever doubted you. And that was before they go on the road to Blacksburg <laughs> and put up 41 points and a 34-point drubbing. No one on Virginia cracked double figures tonight. As a team, they shot 32.7% from the floor. They were two for 12 from three. They only shot 12 three-pointers. They had as many, uh, they, had, they had 12 turnovers and 17 field goals. This was about as bad of a performance as you can get, Randolph. What did you make of Virginia tonight? Poof, Rob, this is hard to describe, man. That was ugly, bro. I mean, that was just a tail kicking. I mean, let's just start from the jump. I mean, both teams started out a little bit shaky, but afterwards it was just like Virginia just decided to play in, in Virginia. I mean, it, uh, I'm sorry, Virginia Tech decided to play in UVA, just didn't show up. I mean, they never got off the bus. I mean, that was a rivalry game. Tech was waiting for them, fed off the crowd, man, offensively. I, I was shocked that they would score as easily as they did. I, mm -hmm. I just, for a team, we, we kind of just said, hey, defensively, they're, they're elite. They weren't tonight, and that was just a flat-out ass-kicking, man. There was a stretch at the end of the first half. I think with – I want to say like 8-15 left before the under-8 timeout. This game was tied. It was 14-14. to It was ugly, but it was tied. It was exactly what you want – what Virginia would want out of a game like this. Um, and then you look up with about two minutes left, a minute 15 left, and all of a sudden the score is 34-14. to We saw a 20 to nothing run. We saw an eight-minute stretch where Virginia didn't score, right? And they go into the half, they're down 20, they're on the road, and look, this is just not a team that is built, her has ever been built, to be able to make second-half runs and be able to find a way to get back into games like this. So it's 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 worrisome to me because the, the, Virginia's more or less built – to not get smacked like this, right? They are built to be able to hang around in close games and find a way to win those close games because they're better than you defensively and they execute better than you offensively. And to me, that is a big concern where this is not the first time that they've gotten their ass kicked on the road. Like this is it's becoming kind of a concerning trend. And and the, the counterpoint here is that when you are playing in the NCAA tournament and when you're playing the ACC tournament, you're not playing road games in these March events, but you're still not playing at home. Right, like this is, I don't know. This is just not what I expected. It's like Virginia turned their season around, and then all of a sudden they showed up tonight, and we got December Virginia again. You know what, Rob? In all honesty, this is the same team that we've Virginia's had for two years. They probably have the potential to shoot the ball better this year than they had last year. But for the last two years, they, they've been prone to scoring droughts like this and having, you know, maybe not as ugly as performance as they had tonight, but they've they've struggled to score. They would go in stretches and eight, nine minute stretches of games all the time. But usually they rely on their defense and they're controlling the pace. They couldn't do either. They didn't defend well tonight and they didn't control tempo. You know, this was played at a Virginia Tech's pace. And so if you know Virginia, you don't want to overreact to it. I mean, this is the same team. I think what's concerning is on the offensive end of the floor, they were able to beat Wake at home, 
but that was 49 47. like you're not mm -hmm. gonna hold people in the 40s and that's the biggest concern they have to have is they're gonna it, it's as simple as if they're gonna make shots mcneely and and other guys coming off the bench got to step up and knock down shots if not they're gonna struggle and uh as much as i like reese beekman he's a two-way guy i think he's an all-conference guard he, he's not a 20 game a night scoring guy he, he does a lot for this team and if he's off just a little bit they're in trouble like he has to be at his best for this team because so much of what he does not just defending and scoring but the other guys need his creativity off the bounce to make the game easier for these guys and and if they're not not knocking down threes, man, then, then they're, they're they're susceptible to these type of performances. They've done it the last couple of years. The, the the question that I was going to ask Randolph was: Is this the kind of win that can get Virginia Tech back into uh, the bubble conversation? But when you kind of break it down, and you and you look at it, Virginia Tech's already above Virginia in a whole bunch of these metrics, right? They're fifteen eleven on the season. They're seven and eight in the ACC, and while Virginia was a game out of first place in the ACC coming into this game. It's not like this is the kind of win that it, it's going to be a, um, a quad to win, but this is not like the kind of win that's going to change a team's resume. Like that's where we are right now with Virginia. And I want to put that into context because Virginia tech at home as a team that has 15 wins on the season right now beats their mm -hmm. rival by 34. And it's not the kind of win that, that it doesn't even really help them all that much. You know, it just no. goes down as basically what it would normally be beating Clemson at home. So that's kind of where we are, where we are at with Virginia at this point. I, Virginia dug themselves in a hole early and they played themselves out of it. You know, and they, mm -hmm. you know, they were in the 20, 21st ranked team in the country early this week. They lost. Now they're out. They're probably the first team in getting votes. They're right there. So they're in the top 30. Uh, the issue with Virginia Tech is winning away from from Virginia Tech. When they were on the road, they're only one and seven in conference play. Like mm -hmm. you got to get wins on the road. And that's the difference in those two teams is that Virginia's defensively, they traveled. You know, when they got they got Dante Harris back and they got Harris, you know, I mean minor back, they brought something to this team and it helped elevate those guys. And so Virginia Tech has has done this periodically throughout the last couple of years. They've started out pretty good. You know, and they started out slow and get sluggish, and then they finish off the second half of the season. They come, they come in the ACC play, just kicking ass and playing good basketball. And for whatever reason, they struggle early or in the midseason, and they seem to be headed in that same direction as they did tonight. But I, again, until they start winning away from home, it doesn't matter. I mean, this team has to start taking their show on the road. They're a tough out at home, but most teams are. But if you want to be an NCAA tournament team, you got to win on the road. And they haven't been able to do so yet. So we'll see if they're able to, to carry this on the road in future games. Um, all right. So let's get into the rest of the ACC because uh, North Carolina and Duke are two games or two teams that we need to talk about here. And I got an ACC guy in Randolph Childress on this show with me. So I want to talk about it, man. Jared McCain or John Henson. I had a couple jokes about McCain, you know, painting his nails and maybe he's a little bit soft when he doesn't have that dog in him. And I think Jerry McCain saw it turn around 25 points in the first half, seven for eight from three in the first half. He put up 35. That is a freshman record at Duke. What does this say to you about the Blue Devils? And did anything that happened in that game at Florida State on Saturday change your opinion of Duke? For me, seeing the dude go off at 35 like that, it has to kind of – that's always going to be in the back of my head now. Like, Jared McCain might blow up if John Henson makes fun of him. <laughs> I tell you what, it shows he, he watches the field of 68. And that's what it sounds like to me. Um, <laughs> Jared McCain can flat out shoot it. And that that's not the thing that surprises me at all, that he he's capable of having a, a game like that. I think the thing with him is I probably want to see more is more off the bounce. I, I'd like to see him attack the, uh, attack you more off the bounce. Catching and shooting threes, he's shooting like 41% from the three. So I'm not surprised that he got going against Florida State. They needed him to. Um, with that guard play, it's going to be a different guy every night. You got Filipowski inside. There's a well oiled machine offensively with that group. My concern with Duke is just their defensive intensity and if they're going to play that way. Um, you know, I, I, Tyrese Proctor can be that guy defensively. He's really good, but then he's touch and go all, on the offensive end of the floor. You know, you don't know what you're going to get. This is a guy we were talking about as a preseason All-American, uh, struggled early, 
Then he hit a moment there, stretch there, where he he started looking like, okay, he's look, live, you know, living up to that reputation. And uh, so to get these guard, if they can get these guys playing collectively as a at least three of those guys playing at a high level, then Duke can beat anybody with Jeremy Roach and Caleb Foster. They have the guard play for it, but I do. Con- my concern is their defensive intensity for that group overall for Duke. All right, give me give me your take on this because Jeff Goodman and I argued about this on Saturday night. North Carolina's lost three of their last six, right? Six. We've yep. ever since Armando Baycott said the ACC runs through me, it feels like people realized and wanted to show him the ACC doesn't actually run through you, Armando. You haven't won an <laughs> ACC title yet. Uh, in where who, who do you trust more? Like. Uh, winning the ACC, winning the ACC tournament, NCAA tournament, like whatever it is, which of those two teams, the Blue Bloods in the ACC, do you trust more long-term big picture? Because I go back and forth on this so much. I, I'm going to say Carolina. I, I, I think it's – I've seen them defend at a high level for quite some time, and I trust them on the defensive end of the floor. Uh, I trust that they seem to be – leadership wise they seem to have figured some things out and one thing we can say about Amanda we was expecting him to dominate before and then he's starting to pick up and, and put up those type of numbers and I thought early in the year he was just really unselfish almost too unselfish but either way they got RJ Davis player of the year Harrison Ingram I like their group a little better just because I think they are a better defensive team than Duke and when you look at their schedule you know they have bro games they're two they're, uh, their last a uh, couple games left five games left I think it's Duke Last game of the year, they're at Cameron, and then they're at Virginia, which is the next game Saturday. So big road game for them there. After the, You can expect Virginia's best coming from there. But after that, they're at home. They got Miami, NC State, and Notre Dame at home. So I, I just like their record there. Uh, we'll know a lot more about both of these teams Saturday because Duke has to come in and the Winston-Salem and play the deep. So we'll see how that game goes tomorrow because they got a big one against Pitt. I like how you say we're going to see – North Carolina at Virginia and get the best out of Virginia. And like, do we even think that that's something that you're scared about no, at this point? They, they, they might, Marcy's like, look, man, they might hit 50. But Virginia scored 90 points in their last two games. 90. We've yeah, seen teams yeah, hit 90 in yeah. damn near one half of basketball this yeah, year. And yeah. RC is like, we're going to be scared because you might see the best out of Virginia. Maybe we saw the best out of Virginia tonight. Who no, knows? I'm just no, setting no. myself up to apologize to Tony Bennett again on Saturday <laughs> after they got to the end of beating up on North Carolina. So listen, RC, we got to get to a break here. On the other side, we're probably going to be talking about the end of this Houston Iowa State game. Houston is up nine. Jamal Shedd has been really good down the stretch. There's about two minutes left. I think we're about to see a dagger here. Also, little teaser here when we come back we may or may not have another person on the show with us as you guys know by now we've partnered with bet mgm this season we'll be using bet mgm lines to make all of our picks and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the field of 68 as we all get ready for the best month of the year march madness if you haven't signed up for bet mgm yet you can use the bonus code field 150 and you will get 150 dollars in free bets on your first wager with bet mgm regardless of whether or not you win that first bet here's the yo best what up i have all you need to do is deposit and bet five dollars of your hard-earned money this is how you make it work Download the BetMGM app and sign up using the bonus code FIELD150. That's FIELD150. Deposit at least $5 and place your first wager on any game. You will receive up to $150 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD150 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available in one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient when I have to go cover games in Philly or New York, which happens quite a bit. When you cross state borders, you just log into your existing account and fire away. You don't have to create a new account in each state. It's easy, it's simple, and it's clean. And most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the conference tournaments and for the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens college hoops odds boost and my personal favorite a nice little parlay boost here and there so download the bet mgm app and sign up today and welcome back hopefully to feel after dark i'm john martin i have been uh 
I, I, put, I put my my cable guy hat on, man. I'm out here doing troubleshooting on a uh, on a Monday night. On top of everything else, uh, as always, joined by my man Rob Doster, Randolph Childress. Good to be with you guys. Looks like Houston's going to get this done uh, against Iowa State away from Hilton Magic. Looks like Houston's going to get the job done in a revenge spot. So, Rob, we'll just start with you. Uh, I mean, what kind of statement is this for Houston coming into this one, having to get it back and, and looking the way they have tonight against this Iowa State team, who who did put up quite the fight for the majority of the game at least? Yeah, they, uh, they're they out here looking like um, Jared McCain in the second half, shooting from three. They were seven and nine last I saw. Um, I, I just I'm continue to be blown away with Jamal Shedd, and I, I feel like – we all had a level of expectation for him last season to be one of the best point guards in college basketball. And he didn't quite come up to that level that we maybe necessarily expected. And I remember talking with Kelvin in the off season who kind of said like the noise got to him a little bit, right? The expectations uh, got in his head a little bit where he thought that he was going to walk in and be this superstar. And, you know, didn't kind of got away from what got him to the point where he was on the brink of being a star. Um, heading into the season. So 24 points, six assists, four boards tonight, six of 10 from the floor. Like he just, he controlled this game to me. And I was really, really impressed. I'm like, look, that Iowa State team can really yeah. guard, man. Like it's it's not a fluke that they are where they are right now. It's not a fluke that they're a top three team in college basketball on the defensive end of the floor, according to Ken Palm. It's not a fluke that they just keep winning at this level with TJ Altelberger. Like he's developed a system and a culture that these guys buy into and they excel in. It's not a mistake that that's happening. And it's also not a fluke that Jamal Shedd is out here doing things like putting up 24 and six on super efficient numbers against a team that's great defensively. Like it's just, this was strength on strength. And it was, uh, I think it was telling to me, I know it was at home and that's a better environment now than maybe it was three years ago, but it was telling to me just how good those guards were like that. That was, that opened up my eyes a little bit to Houston Randolph. I don't know if it did for you. Well, I expected them to win at home. I think the biggest thing for me, I was impressed with just, I was impressed with Iowa State in, in that environment. I thought they got punched in the mouth early. And and these are two, we said it before, it was going to be a rock fight. And, and you know, I, I Houston second half, both teams picked it up a little bit on the offensive end of the floor in the second half. I'd have been, I, initially, I, I was going to be shocked to see a team get to 60. You know, they both teams were flying around. You can tell Iowa State came to play, wanted to get it. But winning at Houston is going to be tough, man. And and I thought Emmanuel Sharp got him going early. You know, he settled him down, got him sco- and scored early in the first half. And then, like you said, I think Shad is just showing. I don't know if there's a better. I think he and I'd say Reese Beekman are two of the better two-way point guards in the country. I think on the, they, they control the game, not just with their offensive output. And he's a little bit better offensively, I think, than, than Reese Beekman is. But they control the game with their offense and their defense. And there's not many lead guards that's doing that. RC, did you expect Houston? And maybe you did, but I'm just I'm just gonna give you the chance to wax on them. Did you expect them to to come into the Big 12 and sort of pick up the way they have? I yeah. I I I mean I thought they would I thought they'd be really good. Win the league, I wasn't so sure. You know, to start, and once we start seeing all the teams that every once we saw everyone, then you knew you knew what they were about. You know, they're a tough defensive team. Um, I was, had my concerns about what they were going to look like on the offensive end of the floor. We knew they were going to guard. We know they're going to rebound the hell out of the basketball. And long as you can rebound and defend, you know they're going to be in every game. But they're figuring out a way to score. It's different guys, but obviously Shed and Sharp are, are, are a big part of that. Roberts got in foul trouble tonight and struggled, but. I, I, you never count them out. I mean, Coach Sampson is one of the, the best in the country, and, and and they're here. He said that before he announced it, before he was going in the league. This team can go in any league, and they're one of the best teams in the country, and they'll they'll be a number one seed you know, in a couple of weeks for the NCAA tournament. So I, I can't say I'm surprised. I thought early on uh, it would be some adjustment. I didn't know they hit the ground running as quickly as they did with it, but you know, there's not a more physical team in the college basketball, so that, that that's going to travel, and they've – and, and Houston is the real deal. I, I don't think they're surprised you know, it's been, by anybody. You know, it's been so impressive to me, guys. Has been Emmanuel Sharp, and um, I mean, he's having a good year. And, and uh, you know, Kelvin hyped him up to anyone that would listen to the offseason. But a lot of times, that stuff is just coach speak, and 
Um, I, I never really know who to listen to and who to just kind of assume like he's talking to a specific player like through the media when it comes to some of these coaches. I'm starting to think that like Kelvin just says it like it is and has just stopped caring about what anybody thinks of him when he says something. Um, but he said he said that Emmanuel Sharp had a really, really good offseason. It was healthy again. I think he broke his leg. He had a season engine ending injury his senior year in high school. And um, he got off to a little bit of a slow start as a freshman, but he came out this year and, and was really impressive early on. And I think with the absence of Terrence Arsenal, who went down with his Achilles back in, I want to say it was December, um, they needed that third score. They needed that guy on the wing. And, and Sharp isn't the biggest dude in the world, but having someone that can just be out there and knocking down shots and pulling people away from the basket and creating that space in the lane um, and and doing the things that he does defensively, like he is tough as hell. He is everything that you think of when you think of a Houston guard and his, I did not expect his presence to make me say, okay, this is a three headed monster in the backcourt. You know, and we know what Jamal shed is. And we know what LJ Cryer was, uh, but now you got Emmanuel sharp back there. You get three guys that can win you a game in that backcourt. And uh, that's not, I, I feel like sometimes I overlook that when I talk about Houston. I think that's why they can make a run. I think that's why Houston can make a run is because they have that, three-headed monster in the backcourt, they're going to defend it being a game. You're not going to run away from them. Um, I know they got their tail kicked at Kansas and, you know, like I said, went in a row, you know, that's not – they're not the only team that's going to happen to, you know, right. at Kansas. So being at home, uh, but getting in the tournament, that team is going to travel. They're difficult out, and they got a three-headed monster in the backcourt that allows them to be – there's going to be in every game. I think they're better offensively than they were a year ago as a number one seed. I think this team is better built to to make a deeper run because they don't have to rely on just, they got a third guy in there that's capable of carrying the load and leading them on the offensive end of the floor. Yeah. Like, like I, I, I sort of am so conflicted about Houston because every single year, like I just, I fall in love with the way they defend. I mean, you, I mean, we all see it. We, I fall in love with how physical they are, how just well coached they are, how active they are. And yet, it just and I, I was like, this is what I'm conflicted about. It's like the postseason results aren't there. They had the one Final Four run in 2021, but like it was sort of fortunate the way that broke. I, I want to say they played four straight double digit seeds um, as part of that tournament run, and then they get blasted by Miami last year. I'm just I just wonder, RC, like is that just variance and the nature of the tournament? Or was there something about those Houston teams in this style that sort of just is out of air by the time you get to the to the tournament? You know what? I mean, you can say what you want. It, it, it's like everything else. It's styles makes fights. And and that people forget how talented that Miami team was a year ago. I mean, you say what you want with Matthew Cleveland and, and, and like guys now, Wuga Poplar and, and, and Joseph were on the bench. And we're talking about Isaiah Wong and Jordan Miller, who were both. I pick, I was voting for Miller to be ACC Player of the Year, and actually Wong had won it. I don't think they put Miller on the black on a uh, on a bracket because they didn't want them to split votes. And that's how Isaiah Wong won Player of the Year. So, incredibly talented offensive team, man. That Miami team was scary. It was one of the reasons we were joking about him, Rob. We were sitting there, we were in the casino, and we were sitting there talking mm -hmm. about it, and we were betting on Miami making a run because they are so scary offensively, you know, and so. It's like Virginia. When you play teams like Houston, Houston and Virginia are great defensive teams. They're not built to play in the 80s. That's not what they are. And if you can take them out and, 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 and able to knock down shots and get in that, then now you got them in unfamiliar territory because they're used to controlling the game, defending at a high level, dictating the pace of it. And sometimes you come across a team and score. I just think this team's different league has the ability to put up points with those guards. With Sharp, man, yeah, I, I, I think you guys can go. I, I still get really concerned about this group on the nights when great offense. Like I, I just, I inevitably think that great offense is always going to end up beating great defense, right? There's always, you're always going to have a level of great shooters that can make tough shots where they're not bothered by having a big defender in their face or guys like Bill Self. I thought what he did when they played Houston was really, really smart, where Houston runs that like kind of, it's almost like a soft hedge, right? Where they just kind of send two guys at the uh, at the ball handler and ball screens, 
And he would set those ball screens very high up on the floor and then pull two defenders to him and immediately throw the ball to KJ Adams at the top of the key and set him up for a situation where he has a four on three. And it's the short roll action. It's the stuff that, um, that the, the Warriors did so well with Steph Curry and Draymond Green. And it feels very weird comparing Dewan Harris and KJ Adams to Steph Curry and Draymond Green. That's not what I was trying to say, but you guys get my point, right? Like, I don't know. I, I think that there's a certain point where there is a level of offense that is always going to be able to work no matter how good you are defensively. And I think that they're, it, it's few and far between, but when they run into that, that is my concern. And to be clear, I think Houston's a top five team in America. To be clear, I think they are a final mm-hmm. four team and probably the best team in the Big 12. But if we're talking about national titles, you got to kind of right. pick some nit here. And that's that's what I think I'm doing. I agree. Uh, I no, think, uh, but you're, I agree with you, Rob. I think the one thing and the reason why I said is it's the one thing that scares you about certain teams is because you know what they're going to do. They're not mm-hmm. altering what they're doing. They're going to go out. They're just going to do a harder and better. That's going to be the you know the conversation that Coach Sampson is going to say to those guys. So when you know somebody's hedging, you get a chance to scheme it and say, all right, well, we know they're going to hedge hard. Let's slip. Let's not. Let's just slip it, flash, and you're going to be able to prepare. So they don't change their defense and how they are. They're just super aggressive and they do it, you know, just just harder and better than you do it. And so, like we talked about Virginia, you're going to come across games like that where, like Virginia Tech is going to drag you out to. Usually you're dragging people, and I call it deep water, and making them play your style of play. But when the game gets up and the pace is going and they're knocking down shots, can't will you, I would say this, and are you capable of changing your defense? Because they're pressuring, like that Houston game, they're pressuring Kansas, and everyone else is kind of backing off like daring Kansas to shoot. And they're pressing up mm-hmm. on Kansas guys. And, you know, Bill Self is one of the best, as, as is Coach Sampson, to make those adjustments. But to your point, I was saying you can – when you know what they're going to do, you're able to scheme it a lot better and, and take advantage of it. And uh, if you have the guys that can do it, and it seems like Miami last year, and there's a few other teams in the country that will have guard playing guys that can that can do that. By the way, uh, Houston, Iowa State closed. Houston minus eight. Mm-hmm. So good luck. Good luck. Some of there. us, hey, sharp betters, John. Sharp <laughs> betters got it at uh, got it at Iowa State plus uh, plus nine and a half. The sharp betters got hey, it at Iowa State plus hey, nine and a half. So bet early, folks. All right, that's your best chance. It's your only chance. All right, uh, real quick before we get out of here, and also real quick, bet at BetMGM too. Nowhere else. Yes. Yes. Uh, real quick here, I want to go over Texas. Texas gets the win at home, 62-56. to 56. Kansas State battles, keeps it close. Texas pulls it out. Rob, where are we on Texas? It's been sort of up and down for them, you know, the last four weeks. They do have two ranked matchups coming up, albeit on the road. Uh, and they actually have three. Three of their next four are on the road, all against ranked opponents. Uh, can this Longhorns team do something? Can they make a little noise here down the stretch? Where are we at with Texas is the most loaded question that you're going to find anywhere in college basketball at this point, because yeah. there are times where uh, where I watch them and I think that they are a it's like, wow, is it, am I sleeping on the scene? Am I not paying enough attention to them? Like, is this like a top 20 roster? here and then there's times where i watch them like nah nah you know what i'm not sleeping i'm on them all that team's going to the nit i don't even think you're gonna be able to win a game in the nit so uh i have no idea i'm gonna send that one to rc i'm gonna pass on that question all right 30 seconds or less rc (laughs) uh tough sled in the next two weeks right uh i I think they're what at kansas and i think it's at texas tech am i correct yep Yep. Um, those are tough places to win man uh, you know, so take care of home in this conference. They're going to get in the dance, and that's all you can ask for. I don't I don't think they're going to make a deep run, uh, but they could win a game or two. All right. It's everybody's favorite day of the week, overreaction Monday. We got a new one on Kentucky every week, it feels like, and Coach is going crazy. We'll get to that when we get back. Field of 68 after dark. Big news, guys. I am thrilled to announce that we have partnered with Autograph a company founded by the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. The Autograph Fandom app gives you access to the best college hoops content, fan contests, and exclusive rewards like discounted tickets, all for doing the things that diehard fans like you already do, following your favorite team in the news, 
and listening to podcasts just like this one. When Tom, and yes, I am calling him Tom, we're on a first name basis these days, co-founded Autograph. He had one mission in mind, change the fan experience for the better. It works like this. You get all of your college hoops content you want in one place. You get articles from your favorite writers, pods from your favorite hosts, contests from your favorite creators, all on the feeds and the sites that you already enjoy. But instead of having to go to all these different places, it all comes to you in one spot, the autograph fandom map. But here's the best part. The more content that you consume, the higher you rank in the app. As you consider the level up and status on the app, you can unlock unique rewards curated exclusively for you. So download the free autograph app in the app store and use the referral code F68, that's F68, or tap in at the link in the description below or in the podcast app of your choosing to start earning points for doing something as normal as listening to this very podcast. It really is that simple. What the fuck? Welcome back to Field of 68 After Dark. We are now live on Sirius XM. Catch us on YouTube. Uh, catch us everywhere. We're ubiquitous nowadays. Uh, I'm John Martin, joined by Rob Doster. I, I love these new, uh, I love these new uh, superlatives, by the way. It's one of my new favorite things. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential with these as the season goes on. Randolph Childers, who is, uh, we worked that into his contract. We have to ask him about Michigan State every time he comes on uh, and has a hit on After Dark. And I, I think we're going to find a way to do that. So uh, make sure you get those questions in on the chat for last call as soon as this show is over. But it's Monday. You guys know what that means. It's overreaction Monday, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, it was quite the weekend. Um, Coaches everywhere felt like we're going crazy, getting after their players, lighting in. I mean, we are at that time of the year where, uh, you know, it's nut cutting time and, you know, the rubber's meeting the road. So let's get it going here, boys. Um, Penny Hardaway and Rick Patino both took aim at their players. Rick Patino of St. John's certainly more directly uh, than, than Penny. Rick Patino called out by name. Uh, and this is what he said. We kind of lost this season with the way we recruited. We recruited the antithesis, the way I coach. It's a good group. They try hard, but they're just not very tough. Joel, slow laterally. Chris Ledlam is slow laterally. Sean Conway, slow laterally. Drissa is slow laterally. So everybody on the team is slow laterally, which is why I just went ahead and joined in, right? We might as well. Um, so, RC, I'm going to start with you on this issue. And, again, Penny's was a little different. Penny's was was more, you know, general talking about how it's difficult to keep everybody happy. And when they're not happy, they shut down. A lot of these kids haven't won. They said they wanted to come here and get to the NCAA tournament, but because they haven't won, maybe they're resorting back. This team is now tired of guys just quitting and shutting down. Everyone's caught up in the name. So two different approaches, two sort of, you know, pointed press conferences here, RC, as somebody that's done it at that level, played and coached. Um, what do you make of these decisions to go so public? I would I would imagine Penny is frustrated. Uh, I I would, as a player, you obviously would understand and respect the way I think Penny Hardaway handled it because he didn't kind of single anybody out, right? So, um, I think what's left for Penny to do is just start benching guys and 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 doing something else of that nature. I, I think it, that's I I read and I saw an interview of him talking about the team that was that had won 10 in a row or was doing that 10 game stretch that reached 10th ranked team in the country, I think it was, uh, was, was, it's, it's not the same team. Uh, so, you know, I know we've talked about the injuries. We've talked about Memphis a bunch, but this team is just not the same team on the defensive end of the floor. They've lost their identity there. And I think it's carried over obviously into the locker room from what you're hearing. And, and, and I don't know if they can get that back. Uh, that that's going to be a difficult task. The Patino situation is totally different. I, I don't know um, how that's going to go over well, even beyond that. I, I I don't think NIO can fix everything because I, th I still think at the end of the day, it's St. John. Um, I have more questions about it with, with Rick Patino in a sense. And again, Rick Patino is one of the greatest coaches to ever do it. Let's no, let's make no mistake about it, but I think it'd be hard pressed to be able to talk about players and do what he did today and expect guys eager to sign up to go play at St. John. 
because the money that he's well, going to have, there's going to be other programs that's going to have money too. Yeah, so I, I'm less. I don't think Penny did anything wrong. Like everyone, no, I don't it's think very obvious. Yeah, it's very obvious what's going on in that Memphis locker room, and it would be very easy for Penny to come out here yes. and just start pointing fingers and blaming people. And he probably wouldn't be wrong because I am still on the Penny is a really good coach and has been really successful and overachieved a couple of different times throughout his tenure at Memphis. So I got no issue with what Penny did. Like I, whatever. The Rick Pitino one is fascinating to me, and it's not because of the quote that we put up there. It is because what he said, where he, this is the most unenjoyable experience of my life. And if you know anything about Rick Pitino and what has happened to him throughout his coaching career, like if this is the thing that is the most unenjoyable experience of his life, like it's got to be bad right now. And Arce, you mentioned NIL isn't going to change anything. Yeah, NIL ain't going to make Joel Soriano better at guarding ball screens, right? It ain't going to make him quicker laterally. Like, but he wasn't kinda... that from the beginning, Rob. I, before you no, paid know, him all I know, but, but here's but here, but here's well, what happened was we all kind of assumed that because it's Rick Patino, he's going to be able to take whatever he has on his roster and be able to put it together while ignoring the fact that he basically had two weeks to go out and get whatever he could in the transfer portal, throw it all together and hope that it actually works. Um, I think that the problem that we have right now is when it comes to the expectation that no matter who the coach is, no matter how great they are, that they'll be able to get things fixed with one transfer portal session, right? Worth one transfer, uh, with one spring in the transfer portal where you don't get the chance to be able to spend a lot of time evaluating these guys. RC, you've been through it, right, man? Like no, a lot of times, I, like the these recruitments the happen in like six days. So uh, I'll uh, just uh, hold on. Let me finish the thought. Before. Wait, um, wait. I think a lot of these, we, we, we kind of expect a little too much out of one transfer window. Sometimes you're going to hit it. Sometimes it's not going to work because you're going to get the perfect pieces, especially when you got to get 12 new guys coming in. So, like, I get it. He's Rick Pitino. He's the GOAT. But maybe we shouldn't have just kind of blindly said this team's going to be a top 25 team because they got Rick Pitino there. Maybe that was dumb, Jeff Goodman. <laughs> but I think the first thing or the last thing is stupid that Jeff Goodman said. So why, why would – we don't even mention that. I, but, Rob, my question would be, are we overestimating – Let's say we consider St. John, you know, being in the Big East one of the a high major gig. Or are we, are we not? Yeah. Or no? Right? Yeah, no, it's and a great job. The last, time, the last time Rick Pitino was at a high major school was 2017 at Louisville. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed since 2017 to now. And my question to you is, can the way Rick Pitino has built this Hall of Fame career Will that will that translate at this high major? Because we just automatically make the assumption that it will. And as we've seen in the last seven years, we've lost a lot of Hall of Famers that could not make this transition the way they wanted. I, I think it will because I think Rick Patino is wired differently than a lot of those other coaches. Like, I don't – does he does he golf? Does he do any – like, I think all he wants to do is go coach basketball and then go to, like, his fancy dinners. You know what I mean? Like, but that's so I, I, think I don't know if you can do that anymore, Rob. Because Rick Pitino is one of those – like, he even threw his staff underneath the bus on this one. It's like, hey, we didn't get mm -hmm. the players that I want, that I like, that I want you guys to get that, that, that fit me. And these kids yeah. nowadays don't really give a damn. They don't know who Rick Pitino is. They don't give a damn about Rick <laughs> Pitino. And if they and yeah, if you got money to offer him, the money that he's going to need to win in the Big East to compete, they got other options is all I'm saying. I'm not saying they won't. But when you do stuff like this and you say stuff like this, it just makes it harder for somebody to say, all right, you know, well, yeah, I'm going to go sign up for that. Well, yeah, Rick no, Pitino's I mean, 71 right. years old, right? I mean, he's at the point where he don't give a damn either. So yeah. you've got, you know, you've got sort of, you know, the immovable object and the unstoppable force kind of meeting here. Who ain't changing. He yeah. ain't changing. That's right. So that's why right here. it's like. Here's the last thing I'll say, and then we can move on because we got more overreactions we got to get to. You are not wrong, RC. I, but I'm going to wait for more than one one transfer portal, like one spring, before I completely bury Rick Patino. You know what I mean? Like, no, no, you're, you're not, not wrong. I, it's, it ain't working no, now. No, no, yeah, I'm not burying it. You said he's got to retire. You said end his career right now. Put him <laughs> in the grave. <laughs> I, do, I, do think, I do think coaches should stop bitching. It's like it's unbecoming. 
Like if you don't want to, if you don't want to take two to three million dollars to deal with NIL on the transfer portal, I guarantee you there's a long line of people who who will. I mean, are, are you that removed from being a normal person that I mean you pick the players, my friend. You pick the players. Bottom line. I'll do it. It all comes back I'll to do you. It. It's not an escape I'll route. You don't get to, you know, it's it's that simple. So Hey, um, look, you know what? Right. You, you give me a salary that's got two commas and a crooked number in the front. I'll do whatever you want me to do, baby. I'll deal with Yeah, I mean, I'll take your SAT for you. I'll take your ACT. I'll do all that bullshit. I mean, you 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 give me that paycheck. You, you ain't going to hear a complaint up out of me, right? I think sometimes <laughs> these coaches just forget. Are you guys saying like all this because we're talking about Rick Patino here? Is this, is this what I'm hearing? Is this am, am no, I, it's is Penny, this too. Penny. Like, I, and I hear this from coaches on NIL all the time. Mm. And I know it's so hard. Oh, the transfer report is so hard. Shut the hell up. <laughs> Coach a team. Win some games. Everybody's dealing with the same thing. It ain't just you, man. It ain't just you that's got to deal with the portal. Right? Hey, the Memphis I mean, just came out. Everybody's got the same thing. The, the Memphis just showed up. The Memphis just showed up. The Memphis is here. <laughs> it's so hard to keep everybody happy. Shut your ass up. Coach a team. Win some games. That's simple. That's the job. It's always been the job. That ain't changed. Win games. It's a it's a it's a results based business. It's about production. That's the way it's been from the beginning. It's the way it's always going to be. So cut the bitching, man. Nobody wants to hear that. I'm yes. back. I'm so proud of you. Hey, John. I'm so proud of you right now. You came back. I thought you bailed out on us because you ain't want to talk about Memphis. You came back and stopped nah, talking about here. Memphis, man. I'm gonna I'm, I'm give I'm gonna clap it up for you, man, because I thought you bailed out. Of, you thought Rob and I was gonna talk about Memphis. Nah, we was waiting for you to come back. You wasn't getting over like hey, that. It goes for everybody. Everybody's on notice. All right, let's go to a couple more here. Um, Purdue goes down at Ohio State. They get the uh, interim coach bump and pull it off. Uh, some positive regression for the Buckeyes. Here's the, here's the overreaction, Rob. This is the start of another March swoon for Purdue. No, no, like here, look, the bottom line is this Ohio state was better than what they were at the end under Holtman point blank period, but the talent on that roster, they should not have been as bad as they were under Chris Holtman. I think he lost a locker room. I think there was uh, some stuff going on there and it just wasn't working for him. And they kind of had to pull the plug on it. Uh, but they were not as bad as their record showed. Uh, they got the new coach bump. They showed up, they were ready to play. And it was one of those nights where it just didn't quite work for Purdue offensively. I don't think it's the start of the March. I'm not, you know what I'm, I'm doing guys. I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm not going to be the guy that sits here when a team loses on the road in conference play and completely buries anybody. And I'm not just saying that because I got to be on the show tomorrow night after Creighton goes and plays at, or after UConn plays at Creighton. So I'm just kind of setting the bar right there where I say, don't overreact. Right, I know this is over. Yeah, oh, you, I, I, all right. RC just threw in the towel. Yeah, they're done. Lock it in. Purdue is losing in the first round. It doesn't matter who they're playing. Give me Norfolk State. No, no, no. Give me NC State. I'm talking Central. about they're you. Done. I'm they're talking done. about you. I'm about to tell Trevor to mute your mic right now because you're lying to people. We don't lie to people on field to 68, Rob. That's right. That's right. He he is. He's he's. What do you think, RC? No, I'm not worried. I, I'm not worried at all. I, I'm, I'm not worried about a team that's here. It's February the 19th, and they have three losses. And I'm worried about them. You got teams that had three losses in November, and this team has three heading into March, and we're worried? No. I, I, like I said, I do – like we talked about before, I, I, Purdue has the most dominant player in college basketball. Um, they just have to get two of those three guards playing well and some consistency out of that four-man spot. And, and they can beat anybody. They've proven that. Uh, we're just in a dog month of the year, man. We need to get through and get to the conference play. Once you finish the regular season, there's an excitement again. I think you get rejuvenated right, right now. Um, they're, everybody's, they're everybody's homecoming in the sense of everybody's back on campus. The gyms are packed. Everybody's excited about it. It's Purdue. And they're the most dominant team in the Big Ten. Um, you know, we, we talked you know about it. Is? You know what else it is? Like, they're going to win the Big Ten. Right, yeah, like yeah. they're going to win the Big Ten. It's it's hard to get up for it when you know you're going to win it. When you did it last year, when the only yes. thing that you yes. care about is making a run in March, and you go on the That's road against a team whose coach just got fired, and like they're all jacked up and they're talented, like shit, like that happens. It's college basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and Ohio State was due some. I mean, it's the easiest spot in the world to get up for at home, number two team in the country coming in, new coach, first game. 
I mean, it's just situationally, it doesn't really get easier than that. It doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but in just terms of peak motivation, it ain't going to get any easier than that. All right, when we come back, we're going to get into Kentucky. We got another overreaction about Kentucky and UConn. Lots more to come. Field of 68 after dark. What's going on, guys? Before we get back to the show, I need to let you all know about the Field of 68 Daily, an all-encompassing college basketball newsletter that arrives in your inbox, you guessed it, daily. For less than a dollar a week, you'll wake up every morning to more than 1,500 words detailing everything that you need to know to stay up to date on the world of college basketball. From the notable mid-major upsets to the stars that are out injured to the breakout performances that only our team of college basketball junkies watched. The Daily is edited and produced by Mike Miller, who spent more than two decades running NBC's digital written content and is subscribed by more than half of the Division One coaching staffs, the biggest names in college basketball media, and the agents that work as power brokers in the sport. For just $50 for the year, you get access to the same information that the insiders get. And before we get you back to your regularly scheduled Field of 68 content, let me tell you guys about the Field of 68 merch store. Head over to fieldof68.shop for officially branded Field of 68 apparel. Whether you're supporting your favorite team in the student section or from the couch, there is no better way to gear up and the latest from the Field of 68. The best thing I can say about our merch is the quality of the product. Anyone that has ever worn a t-shirt knows how frustrating it is when the neck gets all stretched out and the bottom of the shirt starts looking like the bottom of bell-bottom jeans. And there's nothing worse than a hoodie that loses its snugness that makes it such a perfect way to stay warm during the cold winter weather. Whether you're shopping for yourself or for the college basketball fan in your life, everything you need is at the Field of 68.shop. All right, welcome back to Field of 68 After Dark. We are here on Sirius XM. We are on YouTube. Uh, in just a little bit, we're going to be on Stadium as part of Last Call. So if you have any questions that you want Rob or RC or myself or all of us to answer, make sure you get those into the chat, and we'll see you in about uh, 15 minutes over on Stadium. All right, a few more overreactions to get to here on Overreaction Monday, gentlemen. Rob, Kentucky is the – I'm just reading these, by the way. Okay, I'm reading these for everybody at home, reading these. Kentucky is the best defensive team in the SEC, Rob Doster. <laughs> I mean, look, if they played like they did on Saturday, then yes, they are. Like that, that was a dominant performance against a team that came in as a top 10 offense on Kempom, right? Um, I am not yet convinced that we're going to be able to see that every single night from Kentucky, but uh, there's three things that I think are worth mentioning. One, Ugana and Yeso played 36 minutes. He hasn't played 36 minutes before. He is their best defensive weapon, not just protecting the rim, but in playing drop coverage and playing ball screens. He's like the only big guy they have that has any clue what he's doing on that end of the floor. Two, Adu Thiero is back and healthy and playing well. And at the four, he's a difference maker because of his energy and athleticism and the fact that he just plays his nuts off for every second that he's on the floor. You need guys like that. And three, DJ Wagner healthy. I think he's their best point of attack defender. And putting all three of those guys on the floor for as many minutes as they did kind of changed some things. So all of a sudden you went from having two or three like sub average defenders to, you know, you having Rob Dillingham play for the 25 minutes and the one guy that really is not um, a, a good defender on the floor. So I'm buying them as having a better defense than we've seen uh, during that three week stretch where they looked horrible, but they I, it's an overreaction to say they're the best defense in the SEC at this point. You know, Tennessee still exists. Yeah, like I think like RC, the better sort of way to frame it is Kentucky has fixed their defense. Is that an overreaction? Uh, we'll see. I think the question is, can they do it, be more consistent on the end of the floor? They've shown, they've had moments this year. I know we've given them crap about it all year, kind of questioning that, but they've had moments throughout the year. Have they figured it out? You know, like Rob said, they seem to be late in the year. And is he shrinking rotations and shrinking minutes? And Oyensu on, uh, Oyensu on the defensive end of the floor, 36 minutes and, and having an idea of what the hell you're doing and anchoring that defense. He is bailing out some of the guard play sometimes when they're not keeping the ball out in front. And so if he can do that, be a lob threat, screen and roll to make himself more effective on the offensive end. And I do think at some point they got to get Trey Mitchell back. And I think it's it's important for them in the early rounds of the tournament. I think they need him back because he also gives them that option of if you if you need to play small ball five, 
and, and we worry about this team in those early rounds. I think the talent-wise, nobody questions uh, Kentucky's talent, you know, offensively. They're a Final Four talent. Uh, but defensively, if they can get some consistency on that end of the floor and be able to put guys out there that, that, that can consistently defend them and have an identity on the end of the floor, then, yes, I think they got a chance to – you know, Tennessee's still the best team, I think, defensively overall, but – We've seen them play at a high level, and you just need to be decent at def- defensively because they're such a high-powered offensive team. Yeah, that was a big win, no question about it. Hard to overstate the importance of going in there and pulling out a win in the jungle. All right, couple more here. UConn, Rob Doster, is going back to back. Yes, next question. Yeah. <laughs> Easy show. <laughs> Easy show. No, look, they're, I think that they're the best team. I think they're the most dominant team. Um, the NCAA tournament is the worst way to determine who uh, is the best team in college basketball. It's the greatest way to determine who the champion should be in college basketball, but that doesn't always necessarily mean it's the best team. For example, 2014 UConn, 2011 UConn, like it just – it's the NCAA tournament, man. That's the beauty of it. And uh, we'll see if that means that UConn can go back-to-back, but I think right now they – are deservedly the odds on favorite at bet MGM. And I don't think that that is going to change the rest of the season that uh, they, they just, they've been dominant, man. It'll be very interesting to see what happens now that we're all hyping them up on the road tomorrow at Creighton, which is uh, one of the perfect buy low spots. I think you could ever find sell high spots, John, you're the gambler. I think that you're on that with me. So um, it's yeah, they're, they're, they're awesome, man. I don't know what else to say. I've said so much about UConn the last three days. Like they're, they're just awesome. RC, go ahead. Nobody's happier about UConn being in this position right now than you are. We know that. We, you, you know, there's one know, person. I'll say this. Your best I, friend. I'll say this. Your best friend <laughs> Hopal. That's true. I, I I wonder if everyone is going to feel like this because I don't believe they're going to go five and zero. You know, to the rest of the year. I mean, I think they got they're some not. tough games, and they won't. And the question is, how many will they they lose? I mean, at Creighton, say what you want about a Villanova team that beat them already. It was a one point game. Um, Seton Hall. Um, and then at Marquette. They're game at Creighton, game. at Marquette, at Providence. They got their three toughest road games coming up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's. So if they drop two, if they drop two games, will they still, they won't be the number one seed. And so that's why I say, we, we say that now. I just think that they're approaching a difficult point of their schedule. Will it change any way I feel about them making a run in Phoenix? I don't. But I do think they're they're going to face some challenges here in the next five games, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if they were dropping at least two of them. Damn, damn, two out of the next five, I, and, and that'll put them at what? That'll put them at what? Four losses on a year? Oh my God! UConn just, suck. They dropped four I mean, on the I, year. Oh my <laughs> God! I just I don't know. Get the double buy? We just put him in the in the Eastern Conference Finals. Like, get out of here! Yes, <laughs> yes, four games. yes. I think they're I think they're like that. RC, cut it out. They like that. They're gonna, they're going to go into Creighton tomorrow and handle business, bro. Like that's okay. what they do. They're that's what like okay. it's just what they do, man. I can't explain it. Okay. I don't know. Dan Hurley's living right, man. He's got some juju. There's no doubt about it. But. All right, we got you down, man. Two of their next five. Two of their next five, they're not going to get. Uh, okay, finally, Coleman Hawkins, Rob, is the heel that Hunter Dickinson wishes he was. I, I've come all the way around, all the way full circle on Coleman Hawkins, and I think he might be like one of my three favorite players in college basketball, and this is why. There is nobody that understands how to troll a fan base and understands how to use the internet to rile people up in college basketball better than Coleman Hawkins. We all saw what he did with the Maryland t-shirt, right? We all saw what he did where he changed. Like, there you go. You see it right there. Look at that. Come on, man. How do you, how do you not love this guy? I, I do respect I, I think, I, I think that, um, I think it's obvious that like the one thing I want to see out of this year is, is UConn winning, winning a national title. I don't think I'm really breaking any news there, right? I'm a UConn fan. I'd love to see it. That's the thing I'm rooting for. The next thing I'm rooting for is to see Purdue and Matt Painter and Zach Eady get to a Final Four, be able to get that monkey off their back. Um, I would love to see them win a title. I would love to see them cut down some nets. The next thing that I'm rooting for is Coleman Hawkins to make a deep run in the tournament so we get him just out there talking his junk, 
being able to put people on blast, being able to go out there and 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 tweet and say what he needs to say and get and get off these jokes. And it's just he is so funny to me. And I just I love that we have this presence. You know what I mean? Like if he imagine if he played for Duke. Imagine if he was at Duke, on Duke, doing the stuff that he's doing right now. He would be the most hated player in college basketball. Look at this. No need I to mean, apologize, man. Y'all are all the same age. Like, he is so I mean, we do, we do need. I mean, that's that's not so much a heel, but, like, I, I, I do think college basketball sort of needs that guy, RC. Like, I don't know if it's Coleman. I don't know. Like, it just feels like, you know, when I think about the my favorite days of college basketball, it was like J.J. Redick at Duke. Like, it was just so easy to just – root for everything he stood against and i've been missing that guy you can it's okay to still hate duke no i'm kidding um i can't say that now <laughs> you're um, not you're not though man don't lie don't walk back. no you don't have to i mean you ain't gotta hide no, who you are they, they don't, uh, you know what it's 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 fun when you have and they're winning and they're good i think that's why it's relevant i mean this is and he's playing better i i, I think he is you know his consistency and and we've talked about these guys enough and and what they've gone through and what they've had to sustain. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy for that group. You can cheer for that team just because of the way they've handled and everything they've gone through. So I think it's funny. I enjoy watching them. I hope he talks a bunch of trash. I I, I hope they make a run in the conference tournament and make a run in the NCAA. Um, I just would like to see if, if I could – I think everyone would want to feel from a, a, a Final Four or a championship game would like to see Purdue in, in UConn. Uh, just because of the, the, they've been the two best teams all year, we probably won't see it. It just never works out that way. But uh, I'm 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 cheering for Illinois just because they, this team has gone through a lot. All right, fellas, mm-hmm. let's run through this real quick before we get to last call. Let's do toast of the night, Rob. Start us off, brother. Who are we toasting? Uh, I I got I got two toasts that I'm going to send out. The first one is going to uh, going to Terrence Oglesby and John Fanta, who completely ditched me tonight. Right, like my my DTF podcast partners went out and did a game in Charleston and did not invite me, did not tell me, did not let me know. I guess they just don't want to hang out with me, man. I don't know. Maybe people don't like me. Um, my next toast is going to go out to uh, to Robert Jones, the head coach at Norfolk State. Uh, they had a battle for first place in the MEAC tonight. They beat NC Central. Um, and Laval Moton. So to to Robert Jones and to uh, to John Fenton and Terrell Togglesby, thank you for forgetting me. Uh, real quick, uh, Virginia Tech, largest margin of victory over Virginia since 2007. That is how you exact revenge. So I'm going to give it to the Hokies tonight for getting that done by, uh, what, 34? What a win that was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was an ass kicking. RC, what you got, bro? I, I got two. I got I got T.O. and Fanta as well for ditching Rob. Way to go, my boys. Toast to you guys. You guys finally did something to make me proud. And then I'm going to go to Houston Cougars, man. They take care of business at home tonight. It's a big win against a big team, big physical team. They stepped up and got it done. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us here on a Monday night. We're headed over to Stadium for Last Call. For Rob, for RC, I'm John Martin. Thanks for tuning in.